That's a good word. I want to invite you to reach and grab your copy of God's Word and open it back up, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. And as we go back to Colossians chapter 3, I want to continue a sermon that I started preaching last week uh, through Colossians chapter 3 entitled, The Art of Christian Living, or The Basics of Christian Living 101. And I, I started that last week, and I want to continue on through Colossians chapter 3. And as I opened up last week, uh, share sharing with you that Paul has a, a familiar pattern uh, in his books, especially in his epistles that he writes, is the opening of his book is usually doctrinal, theological, or Christological in nature. And then he turns from the theological or doctrinal or Christological to the practical. In other words, Paul understands first and foremost that we have to know what we believe. But then he also understands that how I think and how I believe affects how I act and how I talk. And so that's why in his books, he always leads with the teaching, the theology, the Christology, uh, the soteriology or the salvation talk or the church, whatever it is, ecclesiology. And then he says, here's how it fleshes itself out. And last week we opened up by looking in Colossians chapter 3 under the idea of the art of Christian living. We looked at a few points, but it's all wrapped around this idea that Christ lives in me. And if Christ lives in me as my Savior, as my Lord, through the Holy Spirit moving through me, that should change how I live. If we go all the way back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, which one is one of the primary uh, uh, verses and passages in this book, I want to put it on the screen for you. It gives us a key to how we should think about our lives and ourselves. Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, look at it on the screen. He says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, as we think about Christ in you, the hope of glory, it's really Christ in me. It's Christ in you. It's Christ in us as the church here at Cottonwood. It's Christ in the life of the believers. Now, he starts off that verse by saying, To whom, and then he mentions the Gentiles. Now, we don't talk that way in our day. We don't walk around and say, hey, are you a Gentile? Are you this? Are you that? That's not how we categorize people in our day, but that's how they did in their day. And so Paul says to them or to the Gentiles, it'd be for us, we would say to the lost, to the unchurched, to the unbelievers, to those we come in contact with outside the walls of the church. Does that make sense? He says to them, the mystery of the gospel is this. Christ in you, Christ in me, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, Christ in us then changes everything about who we are. So what does Christ in me, the hope of glory, mean? What does it look like? Let's go back to Colossians chapter 3, and if you have your Bibles open, I want to encourage you to read it, or we're going to put it up on the screen. I'm going to read all the way down to verse 11. Last week, we made it through verse 7. I won't go back over that material. I'm going to pick up in verse 8 today and continue to explain how Paul says, Christ in us, the hope of glory, affects how we live, how we talk, how we do church, how we live out our faith in our community and among those who are unchurched, those who are lost, those who are not believers. So let's go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Here's what Paul says. Since then, in other words, after all I've said in chapter 1 and chapter 2, the doctrinal, the Christological, the soteriological, the ecclesiology, and all the other ologies he's already talked about, he said, since then, you have been raised with Christ. That's after your salvation. He says, set your heart on things above. Why would you do that? Well, that's where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He says, also, set your mind on things above, not on the earthly things. Why? Because that's what Christ would have us set our mind on. He says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, then appears someday, then you also will appear with him in glory. He says, therefore, verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature sexual immorality, and begins to give a list, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Then look at verse 7, verse 6. He says, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. 
Look at verse 7. This is where we stopped last week. I'm really going to pick it up this week. He says, For you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. In other words, he's saying the church, God's church, and from time to time uh, people will say, Well, you know, all you Christians, you think you're perfect. No, we don't. We're not perfect at all. As a matter of fact, part of the expression of our faith is we are in church because we're not perfect. We're simply forgiven. Amen? Amen. That means the church is filled with a bunch of recovering sinners. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There's not one person in this room that deserves God's grace and God's love. Not one person. That means church is filled with people who are recovering from past sins. That means we have uh, recovering thieves in here, recovering liars in here, recovering uh, adulterers in here. We have recovering alcoholics, recovering thieves, I mean recovering everything. It's in here. We are not perfect. We are simply forgiven. Now let's go on and read. He says, listen, you used to walk in these ways, but you don't anymore because you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, in the life you once lived. That's how we used to live, but there ought to be a difference in how we live now. That's where he picks up verse 8. How do we live differently now? Verse 8, he says, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as, as these. Now get ready. This is where it doesn't get any fun, all right? We got to get rid of all these things. And I want to let you know, some of these are fun, all right? Some of these are fun. He says, but we as God's children, if we are going to have a proper witness, a, a proper impact, a proper Christian walk in front of non-believers and non-Christians and the lost out there, we have to rid ourselves of anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips. Then he says, verse 9, not only that, we can't lie to each other. Imagine that. He says, since you have what? You've taken off the old self with its practices and you have put on the new self, listen to this, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. He says, verse 11, here, everybody say here. That's God's church here in this place. There is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Now, the, the illustration, the metaphor that Christ is use, uh, that Paul is using here is pretty simple. When he says, you must take off certain things... The words in the original language, uh, the Greek language, it's really take off old clothes. You have to take off the old or dirty or soured clothes. Has anybody ever, ever said this to your child? Did you wear that yesterday? How many of you have said that? I think we said that three times this week. Gina said it twice to me. <laughs> What are you saying? You're saying, hey, that's dirty, it's sweaty, it's stinky, depending on where you laid it, when you got out of the shower or after you took it off yesterday, it might begin to mildew, it's going to stink, it's going to impact everybody. I mean, you, that's what we're saying. And so Paul says, take off that old junk. Remember, what is the old junk? It's how we used to live before Christ. And he goes, put on some new stuff. And he says, and we're going to talk about this in a second, that new stuff is being renewed. Everybody say renewed. Man, as long as I live in this world, my clothes need to be washed. How many of you have ever washed a set of clothes that has stayed washed? No. No. As soon as you wear it, as soon as you live it, you have to rewash it, right? That's the way it is in our life. Man, I can be washed in God's grace and God's love. I can walk out of here and say all the anger is gone, all the malice is gone, all the slander is gone. And before I get out of the parking lot, somebody can fire me up. Now, not me, I'm a pastor. But you, you, in your lowly state... No, he says, man, it doesn't take me long to roll right back in to the old clothes. As a matter of fact, I've got some clothes that fit pretty good. In fact, anybody, anybody have this? I've got a bunch of shirts, but I've got a couple of favorites. Anybody have those? Yeah, I do. And you know what? And if that puppy is clean, it's going back on. Holes and all. All. 
That's just the way it is. And guess what? There are some of these sins in your life that, man, you immediately reach and put it back on. And Paul says, man, and God's children, we've got to take it off, take it off. So what does Christ in you mean? Let me just quickly go over what we talked about last week. If you want to know more about how I explained this last week, I want to encourage you to go back, view it online. Last week's sermon is online. So thought number one, we talked about this last week. Christ in me, the hope of glory, means that we have to set our heart and minds on things above. Man, and it's a daily choice. My heart, I'm going to love the things of God where Christ is. I'm going to set my mind on things above where Christ is. Number two, we, took, we looked at this last week. We have to put to death the sins of the flesh. We have to put to death the sins of the flesh. We talked about this last week, that we all have sins of the flesh. And guess what? When I mortify them, that's the Greek word. When I mortify them, when I kill them, they don't stay dead. Why? Because my flesh is always alive within me. Romans chapter 7, Paul says, man, that which I want to do is uh, exactly what I find myself not doing. And that which I don't want to do is finally exactly what I find myself doing. He says, there is this war waging on between my spirit and my flesh. So we have to put to death and keep on putting to death the sins of the flesh. We listed them out last week. And man, I'll tell you, uh, we talked about last week that it's, it's common, it's desirable in today's society to take God's list and Paul's list that we find in Colossians chapter 3 and narrow them down because public opinion tells us we need to eliminate this one. Our, our, our judicial courts say we need to eliminate that one. And we talked about a real biblical definition. If you want to know what a biblical definition of biblical morality is, Go listen to last week's sermon. I gave it to you. And anything outside of that is immorality. Not just one sin. All of those things that fall outside of that. So go listen to that sermon from last week. But as I said, there's none of us that are perfect in here. Remember David? How many of you remember King David? Remember what he said in Psalm 51, verse 10? Put it up on the screen. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew in me a steadfast spirit. Now, as we look at that verse, there are two sides. First, he says, man, I have confessed my sin, create in me a pure heart, O God. But then notice the latter part, he says, and renew in me a steadfast spirit. What was he saying? I know that I'm forgiven, that's the spirit life, but I live in this physical world, and God, I need you to renew me and keep me steadfast daily, daily, daily. So I what? So I won't go back to the old lifestyle. Boy, David, a man after God's own heart, understood that. Ladies, that's for you. Men, that's for me. You, young people, that's for you. It's for all of us. As a pastor, as staff, it's for all of us, each and every one of us. Third thing we looked at last week, and we're going to open it up more this week, is your relationship should draw others to Christ. Your relationships, he says, listen to this. And once were some of you. Here in a few minutes, we're going to see what one person did after being called to Christ, what he did with those past relationships and drew Christ into fellowship with them. So, pastor, you say, how do my relationships draw others to Christ? Here's how it happens. You ready? I want to encourage you to write these down and then live them out. Number one, our relationships draw others to Christ when we rid ourselves of relational sins. Write that down. Last week, we talked about ridding ourselves of sensual sins. Today, we're going to be talking about ridding ourselves of relational sins. These are those sins that ruin our relationships, not only within the church, but outside the church as well. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. Notice what it says. Paul says, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. He says, do not lie to each other since you have taken off the old self with its old practices. He says, take them off and leave them off. Let me just kind of walk you through a couple of these. Anger, that just means that, uh, write that down. Anger, it means a habitual angry attitude. If, is there anyone in here that... Just, boy, you're just kind of constantly seething below the surface. 
and just kind of get angry. I, I admit there are times and and in my life that things are just I, I can't really pinpoint it, but I'm just kind of angry. Anybody? I mean, it's just kind of you know. I, I, and, and there are times I will tell you this that in my prayer and in my conversation with God, and, and a lot of times there's not one specific thing I can point to, but I just kind of just kind of bitter, kind of angry. And a lot of times, let me be honest with you, there are a lot of times that I think as a pastor, you ought to be over this. You ought to be so spiritually mature now that you're over it. And usually it goes away and it passes. I spend some time when I'm honestly, but then usually what happens is when I have that anger that's just kind of there, it doesn't stay in there. How many of you know that? It'll be a sharp word to Gina or a sharp word to the kids or I'll scream at a ref on a bad call, or, which is deservedly so. I mean, you, you do, those, God understands all that. <laughs> Not the Gina part. You know, that anger. And he says rage. See, because if you're, if you're sitting there with, with suppressed anger in your life, rage is going to be that temper tantrum you throw. That, that expressive anger, that, that expressive thought, that saying something. Man, because anger, I've noticed this about suppressed anger. It doesn't stay suppressed. How many of you know that? There's going to be something that sets you off. I was driving uh, my 16-year-old daughter, uh, Jensen, down to College Station uh, uh, yesterday because she's in a soccer tournament down there. And I was on the road with a bunch of other sinners headed that direction. <laughs> I was in full response to your whoops right over here, okay, just so you'll know. And we went through, and, and they said, well, the traffic's this. So we went a little different way down the back roads. And we came into this town. We were coming up to a stop sign. There was our stoplight, I believe it was, because we had to turn left. And it went from two lanes down into one. And as we're just rolling along in the traffic, my daughter and I are talking, and I, I see it coming that we're fixing to go from two lanes into one headed to a stoplight. And so I'm kind of side by side on another car, and I just slow down to let him get ahead of me because I'm going to ease in. As I look in my rearview mirror, someone is flying up in that left-hand lane. And I've got a thought. Well, I can pretty much stop and let them roll on through, but they're not going anywhere. Or I can go ahead and just merge in. So I chose option B. I just merged in. They ran right up on my back bumper and just started laying on the horn. And I immediately stopped at the stop sign. Jensen, my curious daughter, turns around and looks back. And I'm sitting there and I go, what are they doing? She said, they're doing this. And I, go, I said, well, that's good. They're using all their fingers. You know, you never, you never know. I mean, and, and it's not like had I slowed down, they were going anywhere. We're stopped at a red light. So you know how things go. You, you know, have you ever known those people that if they get, they eventually want to get up side, uh, beside you, right? So they can look at you in the face, right? Well, I'm willing to let them. So they pull up beside me, and at that time, Jensen and I looked over, and Jensen said, it's a little girl, just like me. And it was. It's probably a, a, a college, probably one of those Aggie students going down, probably couldn't get, in, <laughs> probably couldn't get into Baylor, <laughs> disappointed about going, going to A&M, all right? Yeah, I got all the, all the Aggies are stirred up right back over here. I'm going to need an escort to the car. No, it, and it just, it kind of shocked both of us that, that this was a young girl fired up. And had I let them go, they weren't going to go anywhere. I'd have been right behind them. And I thought, but rage. Now look at the next one, malice. Boy, that's that hidden hatred. Now listen, anger is that below-the-surface anger. Rage is that anger that is an outburst. Malice, listen to this, is hidden hatred that seeks revenge. Malice is more directed towards one person. Let me ask you a question. Is there someone in your life that has wronged you that you would love an opportunity to tear them up. You would love the opportunity to seek a little revenge. 
See, rage is indiscriminate. Malice has a victim in mind. Go ahead, right there on your insert, write that victim down. Just write their name. Boy, I'd love it if I could just wear so on. Does that make sense? Rage, it doesn't matter who it is. It's just the wrong thing. That girl, she didn't know me if pulling in. It was crazy. My guess is she thought it was a green light and we were going somewhere. She didn't know me. Man, malice says, I want revenge on them. And let's be honest. As long as we live in this world, they may truly deserve it, right? But he says, get rid of it. Why do you get rid of it? Look at what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says. He said, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Let's break that apart. He says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Why? He said, so that what? No bitter root grows up to cause trouble. And then notice what it says, to defile many. Your malice, your bitter, bitterness, your anger never just affects you. How many will it defile? Huh? What does it say? Many. Many. How does that happen? Well, what does a root do? This week, I, uh, I came home, I opened up uh, my mail. I'm sitting there at the kitchen table, and uh, Gina, Gina says, Hey, what's that? I, it was a note from my HOA. Anybody ever gotten a sweet note from your HOA? I'm in violation for something. I opened it up, and it said I was in violation because in one of the HOA codes, it says that your front yard has to be totally grass. Now, if you've driven by my house, I have beautiful flower beds. I have great, I well, as good as I can get them, all right? I've got great grass. It is green, but I have two wonderful oak trees in the front. How many of you know that from time to time, if you have a really nice tree, grass doesn't grow well under the trees? And so they pointed out that I didn't have grass under the tree. And so I cut the trees down this week. I wonder what kind of note I'm going to get next week. Okay, for those of you just shocked, I didn't cut the trees down. <laughs> what do you think, I'm crazy? I just thought about it. All right, I'm a pastor. But I'm sitting there going, well, don't you love the trees? I mean, they're great. And I can't even take credit. for These trees were there when the house was built. We, we're not the first. On, but they're beautiful oak trees, all right? But they're true. it is true that especially under one oak tree, the grass is not growing around the tree. It's kind of beyond it. Now, why is that? Number one is because the beauty of the tree is blocking the sunlight, right? From above. And those roots are sapping the nutrients from below which causes the grass under that tree not to grow. Ding, ding. Anger, rage, and malice is that tree and root that will destroy your life. It will not allow the sun from above to penetrate your heart nor the nutrients from the Spirit of God to provide you the nourishment you need to grow. And you're going to be just like under our tree. And guess what? Roots are pretty indiscriminate. Because if you mow under those trees, you, you have these trees at your house, you mow under those trees, when you go under that tree, it's... Right? Because, man, those roots are on top of the soil. They're moving everything. All of the grass is gone. But we have to be careful. The next word he uses is Slander. Slander. Don't let a root of bitterness destroy you. Slander. Verbal attacks on someone's character. Man, you got to stop doing it. You got to stop doing it. Slander. Then he says, language. Man, language. You have to stop the foul language. You have to watch how you talk. As God's children, how we talk should be different than how others talk. It just simply needs to be that way. Here's another one. Stop lying. Man, stop lying. An untruth or a half-truth is a whole lie. Man, we've got to be careful. And sometimes the slander and everything turns into gossip. Well, what, what, what is gossip? Gossip at that, is that which comes in my ear and out my mouth about someone else. 
that which comes in my ear and out my mouth. If you think about a slanderer, let me, let me just say this to you, a little, little heads up on life. If someone will talk to you about someone else, they will talk to someone else about you. Period. Does that make sense? If someone will slander someone else's character to you about someone else, they will slander your character to someone else about you. It's just that way. And gossip, boy, it goes in the ear, out the mouth. Who is a gossip? It's a person that, man, burns the scandal at both ends. Boy, they're lighting it over here, and they're lighting it over here, and they're lighting it over here. And he says, we ought not to be that way. Instead, what should our language be? Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, put it up on the screen. He says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Thought number two. How do we let our relationships draw others to Christ? Thought number two is this. We have to renew ourselves in the image of Christ. We have to renew ourselves in the image of Christ. That's exactly what Paul said. Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, put it up on, here, on the screen. He says, and have put on the new self. What is the new self? Which is being renewed. It needs to be washed daily, washed daily, washed daily in the knowledge and the image of its creator, Christ. We've already seen Paul says, boy, he had told them earlier in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 2, that Christ created everything. So now he tells them in the image of their creator, they're knowing that he means the image of Christ. What is the image of Christ that we should constantly be renewed in? Look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 19. We'll put it up on the screen for you. He says, the Son of Man came eating, this is Jesus talking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now let me just share this with you right now, and it's going to help us for the next illustration, the next passage. A tax collector in those days had cut a deal with the Roman government. The Roman government was an occupying enemy, an occupying empire, and what the Roman government would do is they would come and they would conscribe with somebody or they would cut a deal with someone who lived in a community, all right, who lived in a community, and in that community they would say, listen, your community and those people who live in your area owe us X dollars in taxes. And anything you can get above that number you can pocket and use on yourself. So let me tell you, tax collectors in those days were more hated than they are in our day. Why? Because they lived in the community and every time you saw their house get bigger and their wealth get bigger and they got a new boat or they got a new lake house or they got a new this, you knew it was because they had overcharged you on taxes and they had cut a deal with the enemy. So imagine the hatred because what would happen is the tax collector had the biggest house and the biggest this and the best that and the best. And everybody knew that when they stepped into the tax collector's office that day and he said, your tax is X, they knew that he had put a lot in for himself. And what would happen is they'd say, how can I owe that much taxes? He goes, well, you either pay it or I take everything you have. So not only did the tax collector have a lot, he had a lot of other people's stuff. He said, well, just bring me your flocks and bring me this. and bring." So they hated the tax collector. But then notice what he says. He says, a friend of, go back to that, I'm sorry, tax collectors and sinners. That word and sinners, we think of just sinners. Let me tell you, sinners in their day were the, would have been the harlot would have been uh, the adulterer or adulteress. They would have been the person who, who just lacks all more. Any pious person in their day would not have hung out with sinners. And here Jesus says, I hung out with tax collectors. Everybody would say boo. And sinners. Now let me go to a passage. And this is going to move us towards explore God. In Luke chapter 5, I want to show you one specific example of what Jesus did in making a connection with the, law, with the lost and how you and I need to model this as God's children. And oftentimes, we do exactly the opposite of this. We go absolutely contrary to Christ's image in me. Remember what Paul says? That we are being renewed in the image of the Creator. 
Let's look at the real image of Jesus. We all know he was pure, he was holy, he was righteous, he was everything. But notice what it says. It says, after this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector. There's the tax collector by, by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. He says, follow me, Jesus said. And Levi, Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Look at verse 29. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. All right. Who had paid for this house? The people, right? This big mansion that he could have this large banquet was paid by robbing people of extra taxes. Surely Jesus wouldn't go in there. He says, then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors, others from the other area, and others were eating with them. If you go to a companion passage, it's not just others. It says, and other sinners, those unsavory sorts, I mean, wicked people, he says that what? He says that a large crowd of tax collectors and other sinners were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Now let me ask you a question. Did they go to Jesus or who did they go to? They went to his disciples. That's what happens a lot. You see someone trying to reach out or minister to someone that's a little bit unsavory, that's a little bit unclean from our perspective. And what happens? A lot of times the disciples begin to talk to one another about that other person. They begin to complain to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus decided, I got this one. He answered and said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Verse 32, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If we're going to be renewed in the image of Christ, we need to understand that we have to be willing to go where they are. A lot of times, and inappropriately so, we think the more spiritual we are, the less contact we will have with the world. And that has nothing to do with it. Jesus took a journey into the seedbed of impurity, ungodliness, and greediness. Now listen to this, and here is the key. Here is the key. Jesus was not at all afraid of destroying his holiness. As a matter of fact, Jesus clearly insinuates he has contagious holiness. And it will do more to harm your uncleanness than your uncleanness can do to, un to harm his holiness. Jesus stepped in to a mill with all sorts because Jesus was willing to call others to follow him. If we are being renewed in the image of our Creator, we won't spend all of our suppers and all of our meals and all of our time with church folks, the savory sort. We will spend a lot of our time with those who are lost and encourage them to follow us as we follow Christ. Now, you always got to be careful with that because if you got a struggle and you're trying to get beyond something, then you might need to get strong because not all of us are like Jesus yet. Third thought, if our, if our relationships are going to draw others to Christ, we have to destroy any and all unholy barriers. We have to destroy any and all unholy barriers. You say, where do you see this? Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. Paul says here, everybody say here. Paul says here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Now, my guess is when you rolled in here today, you didn't say, look there, there's a Jew. That's not how we talk today. Yeah, there's an uncircumcised person. 
don't even want to know. You didn't roll in here and said, barbarian. I call my kids barbarian every once in a while. It's usually dinner table, right? Scythian, you're like, I'm not going to call him a Scythian. That might be good. I'm not going to do that. And then he says, what? Slave nor free. You know what he was saying in that day, in that vernacular? He was saying, man, we got it. When we come to church, when we're in church, when we're with God's people, we've got to get rid of all the external barriers, the unholy, the ungodly barriers. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, let me just give you a couple of thoughts. And, and they're all wrapped up in these terms right here, and I'll try to point them back to you. First of all, he says, we have to get rid of all the educational barriers. Boy, in that day, and remember, go back to Colossians chapter 2, there were, there were a lot of Judaizers who had, who had been steeped in the traditions of uh, Greek philosophy, and, and they began to uh, pat themselves on the back and feel like they were a bit better than everybody else. And Paul says, you know, boy, we, we, we don't come in here. In this church, he, says, he said, in the Colossian church, when you, when you walk in the door, we don't look over here and say, if you are PhD and above, sit over here. If you have a master's, sit here. If you have an undergrad, sit here. If you have a high school education, sit here. And if you're undereducated, sit here. But Paul said there were some that wanted to push that. And so in God's church, we have to get rid of all the educational barriers. Second thing he says, and as you think about it, he says get rid of all the economic barriers. He says slave or free. Boy, in our day, we think of one thing. But here's what he's saying. He's saying, man, if you've got a lot and a lot of people work, with, work for you, you don't get to sit right up front. And he goes, if you've got a little, you don't have to sit in the back. We don't divide you up and say if your household income is under 50000 under 75000 under 100000 under 125000 you know, whatever, and then anything above that. We don't say that. But they did. They said, if you aren't careful, you'll start sitting with your economic class. Third, ethnic. Write it down. Ethnic barriers need to be destroyed. Boy, you say, where do you see it? You say slave and free, and, and you see barbarian and Scythian. That means just non-Hellenized. That means different races, Jew and Gentile. Those, those are races. He says, man, those all have to be taken away. I'll just, I'll just be dead level honest with you. It is my, not my desire to pastor a white church. It's not. Because that's not who our community is. And when we come in here, man, there are no economic barriers. There are no ethnic barriers. There are no educational barriers. None. None. And that's what Paul says, man. Christ is in all. How many of you agree with that? I thought I'd do this, and this is going to be a little bit odd. I've never done it. I've been here 20 years. Hopefully, I can get away with it. All right. I just went to the government website this week, and I pulled up their ethnic designations. Ethnic designations. And I'm going to ask you, as I read their ethnic de designations, when I get to your ethnic designation, I want you to stand and remain standing, if you would, okay? And I want, to, I want to show who we are. Now, if you are that person, if this is your ethnicity, or you're married to someone of this, this ethnicity, I want you to stand. First category, listed by the government, American Indian or Alaskan Native. All right, Native American. You, you can stand. Good. There we go. Give them a hand. Now, let me just say this right up front, because I don't want to forget it. This is who the government says we are. This is not who Christ says we are. Amen? Does that make sense? All right. So who are they? A person having origins in any of the original peoples of North and South America, including Central America, who maintains cultural identification through tribal affiliation and community attachment of some kind. All right? Next category, they say, is Asian. If you're an Asian, would you stand? If you're an Asian, y'all remain standing. You get to stand. You first ones get to stand the whole time. If you're Asians, let me tell you how they define that. A person having origins in any of the original places... Uh, any, any of the original peoples of the Far East, Southeast Asia, or Indian subcontinent, including, for example, including, but not, uh, in, including, for example, Cambodia, China, India, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Pakistan, Philippine Islands, Thailand, Vietnam, and the like. If you're that, would you stand? Give them a hand. We're glad that you are here. 
Here's the next category they have. Black or African American. This is who the government says you are. A person having origins in any of the black racial groups of Africa. If you would stand. Stand if you would. Please stand. Give them a hand. Hispanic or Latino. All right. If you are Hispanic or Latino, would you stand? Okay. Give them a hand. Let me define that for you. A person, a person of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, South and Central American, or other Spanish culture of origin, regardless of race. If you are a Latino, uh, Hispanic or Latino, stand. Thank you. All right. Next. Here's the next group. Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. Okay, Native Hawaiian or other specific islander, would you stand? Who is that? A person having origins in any of the original peoples of Hawaii, Guam, Samoa, or other Pacific islands. All right? If you are, would you, let's give them a hand. Everybody kind of looked around real quick on the Native Hawaiian. Maybe we can go visit their family, right? Wouldn't that be cool? Hey, Mom, my church is flying in today. That'd be awesome. Uh, here, here's the next group, all right? And I want to define this group. I want you to wait on this group because this is the largest category. And I'm going to lay out who the government says is in this group. This last group is white. Everybody stay seated, okay? According to the government... This includes those of Middle Eastern descent. If you are of Middle Eastern descent, would you stand? All right. It says also, not only Middle East, North African descent, peoples of Europe. All right. I'm assuming that some of them were standing because I know we have all of those. And then finally, those who are white, would you stand? That is who the government says we are. That is not who Christ says we are. Amen? Christ is in all, over all, through all, above all. That's all of us. We are a church that is not going to be bound by unholy barriers of education or unholy barriers of ethnicity or unholy barriers of economics. The ground at the cross is level. So I want to close with three things. Number one, explore God. Open your home for a discussion group. My prayer is we all do this. I want to invite our deacons to go take their place at the communion table. Number two, you will notice at the bottom of my insert, I had a number two, and I want a number three. I'm going to have a number three real quick as they get ready. Number two, you heard me invite, and probably it was uncomfortable for some people to stand those different ethnicities. As we move back to the Lord's table, I want to invite us to make sure that we cross some sort of economic, educational, or ethnic barrier at the Lord's table back there. Okay? Please don't go take the Lord's Supper with the people you always take the Lord's Supper with. We're never going to have an impact on our neighbors if we can't cross the aisle in the church to communicate with someone. Sometimes it's because we're shy and we don't know what to say. Bridge yourself with the shy clothes today. Go find someone. Celebrate the Lord's Supper with someone that you don't know. Number three, other than that last category I read off, designated by the government, that white category, if you're in one of those other categories, I want to buy you lunch. I want to buy you lunch next Sunday after the 11 o'clock service, so it'd be right here, right out in the atrium. I want you to hang out with me, and I want you to help me and teach me and lead me so I can grow. Okay? I want you to do that because as a church, you heard the kind of church we want to be. A church that ministers to everyone. And so let me buy you lunch next Sunday after church.
I'm going to pray and then you're dismissed to go receive the Lord's Supper together. Father, thank you so much for this day. God, I pray that, that this is the beginning of our church really moving to be more and more reflective of the image of Christ. And sometimes, God, it means that we're going to enter the houses of the tax collectors and the others and the sinners. God, we're going to, we're going to understand that our holiness is contagious and their uncleanness needs to be fearful, not the other way around. Father, I pray that as we honor you and glorify you as we move to the Lord's table and we remember that the body and the bread and the blood of Jesus Christ is represented there, Lord, I pray that we would cross bounds and boundaries, Lord. Let us get over our shyness for the next few minutes to go meet someone we've never met before and perhaps even take the Lord's Supper with someone we've never celebrated the Lord's Supper with before. And then, God, I pray that you would just honor us and Give us your grace this week as we rid ourselves of some nasty, dirty clothing in order to be salt and light for all those we come into contact with. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.